What I want to look at this morning is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Peyton read from chapter 4. We'll look at both. So if you want to get your Bible and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll be by there in a minute. Um, veils. What do you think about when you think about a veil? Not the veil of the temple, like with a curtain, but veils. Well, you might think of this. You might think of the traditional wedding veil that uh, some brides wear. I don't even know the origin of that. It may be from Jewish custom. I really don't know the origin of it, but we're somewhat familiar with that. Uh, Islamic women wear something referred to as a veil. It covers their face. Not exactly the same thing, but they refer to their face as being veiled. And then you may or may not be familiar with the traditional mourning veil. Uh, this is something that is done occasionally. It's been done a lot in the past. Not as much anymore, but uh, a whim, a women will wear a black veil in, in mourning of loss to uh, symbolize mourning. And what a veil does is it kind of disguises the face a little bit. And we read about it in the Bible. I believe Rebecca, she veiled herself as Isaac come riding up. It talks about her veiling herself. Uh, we, if, you, if you read the Song of Solomon, you'll see veil is talked about quite a bit. Now the Song of Solomon... If it was to come out today, it would come with a warning label. The Song of Solomon would be one of them books, if it was on the shelf today, it would be in the PG-13 section, probably. It's a, it's a graphic love story, okay? And your kids are thinking, I ain't been reading the Bible. So, but that's what it is. But he talks about his lover a lot being behind a veil. And in one place he says, uh, how beautiful your eyes behind your veil. They are doves. Well, the second thing I think is uh, their pickup lines were a lot different back then <laughs> than they are today. This is sound, this line sounds like some lines I actually heard Zach use while we were at Russellville. <laughs> but I mean, I think doves, I think, you know, beady-eyed little girl, I mean, I don't know. And then the second is even worse. Your hair is like a flock of goats <laughs> descending from the hills of Gilead. I, I, I don't recommend trying that line, Drake, at all. A flock of goats line. But the Song of Solomon does refer to the veil quite a bit. Now, the background I want to give you for this morning's message is from Exodus 34. When Moses would go up on the mountain and he would talk to God, he would be exposed to the glory of God, his face would shine, glow, when he'd come back down the mountain. And he would have to veil his face because the children of Israel couldn't stand to look at him. It was so bright. And so it was kind of like, you've seen these watches. It's got the, the, the hands on them that light up when you expose them to light. And then when you turn the light out, they glow. And they gradually fade out. That's kind of the way the Bible talks about Moses. When he would be in the glory of God, he would come back down and his face would be radiant glow to the point where they couldn't even look at him. And so he would veil his face. But that would be fading away. It would gradually fade away until he'd go back in, in the presence and the glory of God a second time. And you can read that in Exodus 34 where it refers to Moses uh, put the veil over his face until he went to speak with the Lord. So that is the background. That's the context I want you to see for this, 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 18, because that's Paul is going to refer to this, and you need to know what he's talking about here to get the background. Starting in verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Paul says if glory came through the ministry of the old law to the point that they couldn't even look at the face of Moses... How much more glorious is the ministry of Jesus Christ that lasts forever? And he says, if, if, if that old law was so glorious, that old covenant was so glorious, even though it was fading away, how much more so will be the glory that lasts forever? 
through Jesus Christ. Verse 12, he says, Therefore we have such a hope. We are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It's not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when it Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Paul uses the veil to make this transition. He said that veil that Moses put over his face also went over their hearts. And he said today, when the old law is read, that same veil still covers their hearts. And remember, a veil separates, right? A veil that prohibits you from getting in there, seeing the real thing. That veil, he uses it to say, it's over their hearts and over their minds. And the only way the veil can be removed is through Jesus Christ. He said that's the only way the veil comes off is turning to the Lord. 17, he says, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And verse 18 is what's up here on the screen. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So Paul says we are becoming more and more Christ-like as we go along with unveiled faces so that the, Lord, the glory of Christ can be seen in us. So he uses this illustration that they were familiar with, with the veil, and we're familiar with to some degree of veils, to say that that veil covers their hearts. And it can only be taken away by turning to the Lord. Now, if you'll look at what Peyton read this morning, flip over to the next chapter, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, and even if our gospel is veiled, so he says, even if the good news is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he said, even if the good news is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing because the God of this age, who's who? The devil. The God of this age has blinded their minds where they can't see the glory of Jesus Christ. He's responsible for the veil. The God of this age puts that veil on. And how did he say? He's done told us how to take it away. Only by turning to the Lord can the veil come off. And then in verse 5, he said, here's why we do what we do. We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We're not preaching ourselves, guys, he said. We're preaching Jesus as Lord, and we are your servants for His sake. That's why. He said, don't think there's an ulterior motive here, because there's not. This is been on my mind this week because of the, the uh, young man at Christ teams that I shared with you Wednesday night. Uh, those of you here Wednesday night, and, and Charlene, I said it was uh, Friday night. It wasn't. It was Saturday night, wasn't it? That's how you knew so much about it. It was Saturday night this young man shared his story with us. And his, his story was one familiar, similar to uh, a lot of ours, and very similar to mine. He, he was one who basically grew up in church but sat on the, on the back pew and never really took part and, and God was just something they did on Sunday. Never really was involved. And he was always secretly depressed but nobody knew it. He was a funny, a funny kid who on the outside appeared to have everything together but on the inside he was really dying, really struggling. And as he went on to share his story, a very heartfelt story that he, that he had, uh, he went on to talk about his best friend getting hurt, being his fault, and how he struggled with that, and how he was mad at God, and how he questioned God, and why God. And, uh, this went on and on, and I kept thinking, sitting there thinking to myself, what's going to be the aha moment? What's going to be the moment that turned this boy's life around? Because he went on with this detailed story of his life and the afflictions for 10 or 15 minutes or so. And finally he said, when he reached the lowest of the low, if 
Finally, he said, I prayed. I just, I just earnestly prayed one night to God. And he said, there wasn't flashing lights and there wasn't thunder and lightning and a choir of angels singing or nothing like that. But he said, you know what? The next day, I felt a little better than I did the day before. And he said, so I'd, I'd pray again. And I'd feel a little better than I did the day before. And he said, thus started the removing of, of this veil. Thus started his relationship with turning to God and seeing God as someone that loves him and has a plan for him and not someone who's against him. Or not someone to be hated and mad at. And I, I shared Wednesday night with you how that was so parallel to the story of my life. And I was in a worse place than, than David was. David was his name. Because I was at the point I didn't believe in God. But I started that same way David did. Uh, and it was so good for me to hear somebody say that because it was like, you know, that wasn't a fluke. That's the way God works. I mean, that's the way God worked. Because that was the same prayer I prayed. One night I prayed, God, if you're really the Lord of the universe and you know all, then you can hear me. And if you can hear me, help me to believe in you. And there wasn't that choir of angels. There wasn't lights flashing and thunder rolling. But you know what? The next day I felt just a little better than I did the day before. And I kept reading and I kept praying. And to this day I still study and I still pray. And He's brought me from that point to this point I am today. And I know He'll continue to take me farther with my faith in Him. But as I was sitting there, I thought about, at that time, not a veil, but I thought about my heart. And how each time I've been to Christ Teens, it takes about 24 hours to get peeled back to the heart. And I went down there this time pretty comfortable spiritually, not really knowing that I had, had, had built this callus up. But it takes about 24 hours. You get there on Friday night, and Friday night so-so. By Saturday night, I, the layers are peeled back, and your heart is soft. And it's malleable. It's something the Lord can work with. 